In the next couple of videos, we're going to be talking a lot about matrix factorization, so things like singular value decomposition. These are ways to take a matrix and write it as the product of some hopefully simpler matrices. Decomposing a matrix into factors is a powerful way to tackle different kinds of problems in linear algebra. However, it also turns out that it's a powerful way to reason about data in the real world. Let's talk a little bit about matrix factorization in general, in particular low rank matrix factorization. Our starting point is to imagine that we have some A, not necessarily square. Let's imagine that it is M by N. And what we're going to do is say that A, this matrix of interest, is represented as the product, let's say maybe even approximately the product of two other matrices, U and V transpose. And what we're going to say is that U and V are tall and skinny. And so A is low rank. To give you kind of a picture of what I mean by that, we can imagine that A is some rectangular matrix. As we said, it's M by N. And we're going to imagine that A is low rank. And so there's some other matrix U and U is N, U is M by K, where K is less than both M and N. And we're going to say that this is multiplied by some other matrix V transpose. And V transpose is also K by N. Okay, so this is saying that A is low rank. That is, it's literally of rank K, assuming that these are linearly independent columns and these are linearly independent rows. Now, usually in linear algebra, we think of low rank as being kind of a bad thing to have in a matrix, but it turns out to be a really nice way to think about structure and data in the real world. Let's take an example that we sometimes call topic modeling. Let's imagine that we have a matrix A and the rows of the matrix A represent different documents in some corpus. So imagine maybe that we have a bunch of scientific articles or we have newspaper articles or, or something. So we have a matrix where the rows are going to be, let's say, documents. So there's some number of documents that are representing the rows of the matrix. And then let's imagine that what we're going to do is represent the different vocabulary words that might exist in those documents, let's have those be the columns. So any given entry in this, if we looked at the ij entry, then this aij is going to be the number of times the word with index j appeared in the document with index i. So many of these things are zero. So you could imagine that in articles on neuroscience, probably basketball has zero counts, but on the other hand, in sports articles, basketball has an interesting number of counts. And so, of course, we would expect the number of times any given word appears to be informative about what that document is about. And so one of the really interesting things we can do is try to discover what we would call the topics associated with these counts. So what we could do is imagine that this matrix of counts from some corpus is approximately low rank, just like we drew up here. What does this give us? So we might ask, how does some entry AIJ come about? Well, it's the inner product between some row of this matrix and some column of this matrix. Right, so it would be taking the ith row and the jth column of this matrix. If we think about this as a row vector, and this is a column vector, and we take their inner product, then this is going to be large when those values tend to align. So we could think of aij as being a row vector from u here the ith one, and we're going to be multiplying that by some 
vj, which is I'm going to say is the uh, is this is the column vector from this matrix V. So document I will have a bigger number of counts for word J whenever this inner product is large. So the idea of topic modeling in this way is to try to discover vectors U that describe documents and vectors V that describe vocabulary in such a way that it approximately explains this matrix. So we get a big set of counts and we try to fit these parameters, that is the entries of these smaller matrices, we try to fit those in such a way that they explain the big matrix of counts. And it turns out that if you do that, you will discover coherent groups of words, words that tend to co-occur. So you can think of these as like correlated words. So if I see the word Barack in a document, I'm probably going to see the word Obama also in that same document. A topic would capture that, and it might put those words together into a politics topic. Basketball and court might similarly appear together quite often, and maybe they would land together into a sports topic. So what we hope happens whenever we do this kind of low rank approximation is that the low dimensional space, that is the, the K dimensions will represent K different kinds of topics, and that the U matrix will represent how much any given document is about those topics. The entry will tend to be non-zero whenever a document is about that topic. And similarly, the words will group into what topics they are relevant to. And in both cases, documents can be about multiple things, and words can appear in multiple topics. What we hope is that we can learn these kinds of vectors from the data, and it will discover topics without being told about them in advance. This is an example of how factorizing a matrix might help us understand and represent a corpus of documents and understand vocabulary. Another interesting way that we can use matrix factorization to analyze data is to think about things like social media. Let's imagine that we represented the follow graph, say, of Instagram with a matrix. So now we might have something a little bit different. Maybe it's a square matrix that's users by users. But here we're going to do something a little bit different. What we're going to do is put an entry in here whenever user i follows user j. So a i j is one, let's say, if user i follows user j. And otherwise it's zero. So this is the adjacency matrix of the directed follow graph, say on Instagram or Twitter. And so the rows are followers and the columns are followees. Again, if we've tried to approximate this in a low rank way, the hope is that we'll discover different kinds of communities and different kinds of interests. As before, we imagine that this is going to factorize. And now, in this case, there's some low dimensional, we'll say again, k inner dimension, but now in both cases, the number of rows and the number of columns here are the same because they're both users. So what we're hoping will happen here is that when we have a big follow matrix with a whole bunch of users, then it will again try to find matrices such that this for user i and user j, i will tend to follow j if the inner product between this vector and this vector is large. So if most of these things are zeros, then the inner product will be zero, and so it will not predict that user i is following user j, but perhaps if they're big, it will tend to be closer to one. So if we fit this to data, what we hope to see, and, and what we do often see in practice, is the idea that the different columns of this matrix would represent different interests or different communities. So for example, on Instagram, I follow machinists and woodworkers and uh, Nissan 300ZX twin turbos. But other people might follow things about fashion or maybe things about the travel or all kinds of different topics, right? And, and of course, people also segregate according to language and geography and, and many other things. And this matrix is representing the kind of content that I'm interested in consuming. So what's going to appear in my feed will be what this matrix is about. And then this matrix is about the kinds of things that people produce. This matrix is trying to capture information about how someone gets followed. So I only produce, say, uh, content about woodworking. I don't produce content about 300ZX twin turbos. So maybe I would have a different vector determining what I consume versus what I tend to produce. Again, the idea here is that 
because this is restricted due to being a low rank matrix, that in order to explain this large amount of data, that we can learn these matrices and that these kinds of patterns of consumption and production will actually emerge just from looking at the fall graph. The point here is that this, neither of these examples of topics or social media feels very much like solving a linear system. And yet factorization gives us a powerful tool to learn structure from the data that would help us make predictions. So some new person comes along and you wanna make a recommendation about who they should follow, then you look at the inner product between them and that content producer. And if that inner product is big, maybe that's a good recommendation for somebody that they should start following. Or it allows you to go in and group different users. So you might discover that some entries correspond to different geographic locations. And so then when you find out that someone is from that area and you make recommendations of content that's relevant to those people. The point is things like SVD actually do give us ways to solve these kinds of problems. So even though singular value decomposition will feel like a very abstract and possibly complicated idea for reasoning about matrices, it has unambiguous real life implications that are far beyond just linear algebra. It lets us analyze all kinds of different data and make predictions. And these kinds of algorithms really do exist and are deployed in the real world. Matrix factorization is one of the most powerful ways to perform recommendation in an online platform. So a very, very common thing and one of the ways that people got started thinking about this was, for example, the Netflix problem, where, again, you can imagine that instead of users by users or documents by vocabulary, it would be users by movies where the entries are the possible ratings that someone might assign to that movie. Then when we discover this factorization, the rows of this user matrix will be someone's taste and the columns of the movie matrix would ideally represent say different genres or directors or different properties of movies that would cause someone to be interested in it. The list of things like this goes on and on and on. People have uh, employed these in lots and lots of different settings and not just recommendation systems, but lots of different problems that people can frame in terms of what's called a matrix completion task.